Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon and welcome to an episode of Likeable Science. This is a, the start of a special series called Likeable Social Science, where I'll be talking with various people from the College of Social Sciences at the University of Hawaii, an uh, amazing group of people that are doing stunning work. To start me out the first time here, I have Reese Jones. Welcome, Reese. Hi, thanks for having me. Reese is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environment, as we were just talking about, a recently renamed department. Uh, to emphasize the interaction, the more interaction with people rather than just sort of the land and what it is, where it is, right? Yeah, I think you know people just seem to always be confused on exactly what geographers do. Um, so uh, geography is really about the interactions between people and the environment around them. And so we've added environment to the title of the department to kind of capture that broader range of what we do, make it more legible to people. Excellent, and that fits in with our, with our topic today on border walls where, when, and why, right? Uh, I mean, it's clearly the, the people moving across the landscape and migrating from one place to another for a wide variety of reasons, as people have always done, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, migration is something that's uh, just a fundamental part of what it is to be a human being, right. to move around. Our, our ancient ancestors were hunter-gatherers, <laughs> and we're always moving from one place to another. Um, but over time, some people started to settle down right. and, and be sedentary and stay right. in a particular place. Um, and as they did that, there were increasingly the needs to uh, restrict the access of other people to those spaces. Yeah, and so right, we, we went, we've gone through different sort of eras of history where borders have been more or less defined, right? And but now we've hit some while ago, sort of post World War II, you might say, we really sort of stabilized things out in a way got pretty well-defined borders with pretty much pretty broad spread international agreement about where these borders are and an agreement from virtually every country on earth to respect these borders and recognize the, the, the sovereign nation on the other side of it. Uh, so then, I mean, a quick obvious question is, aren't border walls sort of outdated then? <laughs> yeah, that, that's a very good question. But, um, if, if you look through the history of borders and of the need to stop people from moving from one place to another, um, in the more distant past, if you think about the, the Middle Ages, um, building a wall was something that was really important for a ruler to do. For example, like uh, the city walls that we see um, in Europe today right. are, are clear examples of that, of a way to, to stop people from being able to access resources and protect a a small group of people in a particular place. Um, but you're right, after World War II um, and with the creation of the United Nations, um, it was less important to do that. Countries increasingly recognize each other's borders, they recognize each other's sovereignty, um, and it's no longer that important for states to build these walls on their borders. Um, right, and indeed, I mean, you point out one of your many articles, and I read a few of them, uh, that at the close of World War II, there were something like five border walls in the world. And by the mid 70s or 80, there were like 15, and now there's 70 different border walls. Yeah, that's absolutely right. There's been a, there's been really a fundamental change in the past 30 years right. around border walls. Um, but let's think a little bit about that previous era and why they weren't really necessary first. Um, like if you think about in the the 70s or 80s, most countries had more or less accepted each other's borders, right. um, and so like the border between the United States and Canada or the United States and Mexico, it was no longer a defensive line where country was worried that someone else would invade, right? right? The US is not worried Canada is going <laughs> to come across that border. Um, that's not really the purpose that that border served. Mm -hmm. um, and so during that period, not many countries built these walls. Right. Um, but as you note, in the past 30 years, really it's it's since 2000, even mm -hmm. as late as, as the year 2000, there were about 15 border walls around mm -hmm. the world. Um, whereas today there's 70 of mm -hmm. them. Um, and so what's really changed is the, the role that these borders are playing. Mm -hmm. So um, what we've seen is over the last 30 years, there's been an uh, increase in the number of people moving between different places, of moving right. from poorer countries to wealthier countries, um, looking for better opportunities. Sure, because of uh, just general poverty, because of local economic conditions, because of warfare, because of, of climate 
events and disasters, all of these things drive people to move. Yeah, so, absolutely. There are all kinds of reasons. Right. I mean, um, in the, the news in the last few years, we've of course seen Syria as a place right. that's resulting in a lot of people on the move. Um, the United Nations has estimated that there are about uh, 65 million people globally displaced by conflict. Right. Um, but if we look at people who are migrating, that's, that's just the people because of violence that right. have been fleeing their homes right. um, and might be perceived as refugees within the global system. Mm -hmm. But there's a whole other group of people who are moving from one place to another, looking for better opportunities for their family, looking for jobs, looking for better education for their kids. Um, and those sorts of movements have also increased in the last 30 years. Sure. I, we deal, uh, my work takes me out into Micronesia a lot, and, and they are losing a lot of their youth because you see no future in these small isolated islands in many cases, and come here or to Guam or to the mainland U.S. and get some education. and. Why would they return back to, to a, a tiny isolated island where they could make $5,000 a year, maybe, if they're really lucky, versus you know, living somewhere else? And so, yeah, there are people who, then there are people who are sort of escaping personal violence, you know, fleeing a, a domestic situation. Uh, there are people who just want to move, right? Just uh, people fleeing per, political persecution. Yeah, so there are a thousand reasons, right, that people will want to leave a country and go to another country. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are lots of reasons. Um, with, with the era of globalization, which right. scholars generally talk about maybe since the 1970s, mm -hmm. the world has become increasingly connected mm -hmm. um, economically and culturally because mm -hmm. um, new information technologies like television, telephone, and now the internet makes it much easier for people to know how people live in different parts of the world. Right. Um, and it, so I think that that also plays a role in creating the, the idea that there are better opportunities elsewhere, that if people can make their way to a different place, that they can also find opportunities for themselves and their children. Yeah, yeah. So historically, have, have border walls really ever been really effective on a, on a large scale? I mean, yes, isolated. Uh, a fortified town may be effective for some period of time, but I mean, the, the, as I understand it from one of your articles, the, the Great Wall of China really is one much more recent than we uh, generally think of it, and two is believed to have been breached within a matter of a couple decades after being built, at least, or had an end run done around it or something, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the effectiveness of a wall really depends on uh, a couple of factors. The first is the scale of it. Um, mm -hmm. If you're talking about a short distance of wall, um, you know, a mile or something like that, for example, around an, a city in Europe, um, or a prison today is another mm -hmm. example of a, a short wall that can be really effective at preventing people from moving from one place to another, right? Mm -hmm. um, but the thing that makes those effective is that they're, one, they're short, so it's possible to monitor that large area. Um, but secondly, there are lots of people guarding it, right? right. So a prison has um, a lot of guards watching those walls and, and cameras and, and security, so it's an observed area. Mm -hmm. um, so on small scales, walls can be effective right. at preventing movement. Um, but on a larger scale, um, it becomes much harder to make those walls very effective. And, and we see, if we look at past walls and contemporary walls that have been built over really long distances, um, they're rarely very effective at completely stopping movement. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned the Great Wall of China. Um, the, the, uh, as, you, as you kind of implied, um, to, we think of it as the, the way that we, we visualize the large stone wall that's kind of on the mountains mm -hmm. outside of Beijing. Um, that was built in the 1500s, right. um, uh, not 2,000 years ago, right. as we often think with the, the Great Wall of China. Right. Um, the reality is there were walls built over a 2,000-year two, period um, in lots of different places mm -hmm. through there. So there was never really a single Great Wall of China. Um, but none of those were really thought of as being very effective. They, were, they would go up, and within a few years, they would be abandoned, because the, um, the rulers found that the, often the horsemen to the north could very easily just right around the end of it, right, right? Or, or find an unguarded section and climb over it. Right. Um, so uh, the Great Wall of China is kind of the, an early example of the ineffectiveness of walls. Right. And certainly when you look at, uh, you know, uh, take the, the U.S.-Mexico border, I mean, that runs through some very wide open desolate spaces and very rugged terrain. It's going to be you know, highly difficult to, to staff a wall, basically, uh, and as you say, uh, without people watching your wall, yeah, it's, it's not going to be very effective. Somebody's going to figure out 
how yeah. to get up over it or how to go under it or how to go through it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the cliche about border walls is that you, you show me a 15-foot border wall, I'll show you a 16-foot ladder, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, so really, if there's not someone guarding it, then it's really easy to get over these things. Mm -hmm. um, what we see with the U.S.-Mexico border, for example, is that um, the, 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 the sections of walls that are built, and particularly the ones that have a lot of agents guarding them, so mm -hmm. for example, near San Diego and Tijuana, um, that part of the border 30 years ago had a large number of people crossing mm -hmm. through there. Um, today, very few people cross the border at that location um, because it is guarded and the wall is there um, and it makes it difficult. But that doesn't stop people from crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. Right. Instead, they're funneled to different locations. Right, Ex exactly. And we, before the show, we're talking a little bit about sort of the odd political ramifications of that in a, in a sense that it's, it's driving people into a uh, much more hazardous journey to, to make this migration they wish to make. Hopefully, in some sense, maybe discouraging some of them from doing it. At least some people would hope that it discourage them. But realistically, many people are going to try to migrate, and therefore they're being exposed to much higher dangers. One of your articles quotes uh, the rate of dead bodies being found in Arizona along the border going from 18 one year to 250 or something the next year. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's what we see starting in the late 1990s and um, early 2000s. So as these walls are built in places like San Diego or El Paso um, and Ciudad Juarez, which is across the border mm -hmm. in Mexico, um, where a lot of people used to cross, as those were closed down, mm -hmm. um, the people find these other routes to go. And so they're forced over this much more dangerous terrain mm -hmm. um, of the deserts of Arizona um, or more isolated places mm -hmm. to cross the border. Um, and that was the intentional strategy, because the Border Patrol knew at the time that there was no way that they could completely close the U.S.-Mexico border. They still right. can't do that. Um, but in the 1990s, they had nowhere near enough agents to, to come anywhere close to that. In 1990, there were only about 3,500 Border Patrol agents, um, whereas there are 20,000 now. Um, and so their strategy was to deter people, mm -hmm. so to make it hard to cross in the cities, force people over more dangerous terrain, um, with the kind of implicit assumption that that's going to kill some people mm -hmm. um, and that other people in the future won't try to make that journey because they know it's so dangerous. Right. Yeah. Oh, it's, uh, it's sort of, sort of frightening uh, to, to think about this. And the other thing is, because there's also been a shift. This used to all be done sort of purely as a governmental process, right? But more and more, it's been privatized, right? And, and we were talking a little bit about, about that issue that, that it almost begins to de develop a life of its own once you privatize it, where the, the private prisons and holding facilities who are being paid on a sort of per head, per night basis are sort of happy to contribute to this by keeping people there for as long as it takes to process them. And, yeah. And, Absolutely. A number of scholars have talked about the emergence of a border industrial complex that mm -hmm. um, includes, one, all of the infrastructure that goes into building the border, building the wall, but also all of the weapons and vehicles and surveillance technologies that the Border Patrol is using, mm -hmm. um, but also the private prisons that are, have cropped up around the border. In the past, if people were detained at the border, they would often either be released to their own reconnaissance until they had a hearing date or return directly t to Mexico voluntarily. Um, today, they're not. Instead, they're put into private prisons, and the private prisons um, are happy to have them stay there for long periods of time because they make money for each night that they're there. Yeah. yeah. So that, that really, that, that again, sort of suggests that, that we should be rethinking the, this whole thing, right, and, and be Certain so new ways, and I know you, you point out that the, the U.S. Border Patrol maintains a fleet, I think you said, of eight predator drones along the U.S.-Mexico border, a tremendous number of quite capable of keeping track of, I imagine, a good deal of the land a good deal of the time, and presumably reporting back when, whenever they're spotting people moving towards the border, so you can direct agents strategically, right? Yeah, there's been an effort from on the part of the Border Patrol to turn to these new technologies mm -hmm. to surveil the border. Um, they have lots of sensors and cameras at the border um, to look for movements. But generally, those have actually proved to not be very successful um, because many of the technologies have a hard time telling the difference, um, for example, between um, a, like a cow who might set off a sensor uh -huh. or just the wind blowing tumbleweed mm -hmm. through an area um, and an actual person crossing in that area. So that I think that for the from the Border Patrol's perspective, those can often be frustrating because it sends them to many locations right. where there's nothing because right. it's a false signal. Wow. We're going we're gonna to dig into this more deeply and, and look into the future then, since we, we've examined a little bit of the past. 
Uh, I'm Ethan Allen, host of Likeable Science here, and this is Likeable Social Science. Reese Jones is my guest today, and we'll be back in one minute. Hi, my name is Bill Sharp, host of Asian Review, coming to you from Honolulu, Hawaii, right here in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Asian Review is the oldest of the 35 or so shows um, uh, broadcast by Think Tech Hawaii. We've been in production since 2009. Our goal is to provide you, the viewer, with information, breaking information about events in Asia. Asia being anything from Hawaii west to Pakistan, from the Russian uh, Far East south to Australia and New Zealand. We hope to see you every Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. And you're back here on Likeable Science with me, Ethan Allen, here on Think Tech Hawaii. With me in the Think Tech studios is Reese Jones, Professor of Geography and the Environment from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, College of Social Sciences. Yeah, this is a whole new se uh, segment on social science, Likeable Social Science. So we've been talking about border walls, when, where, and why. And so we were talking a little bit about the U.S.-Mexico border, using that as a sort of current case example. It's been in the news a lot. So about how much that border is currently fenced effectively? Yeah, it's, um, a lot of people are often surprised how recently much of the U.S.-Mexico border was fenced. Mm -hmm. um, so as late as the early 1990s, there was no federal fencing anywhere on the U.S.-Mexico uh -huh. border. Um, there was barbed wire in some places, but that would have been put up by a local landowner, for example, to control mm -hmm. their, their cattle or something like that. The first fencing was built in 1994, um, some short sections um, in San Diego and El Paso. The, the large section of fencing that exists now on the border um, was built after the Secure Fence Act passed okay. Congress in 2006. Um, so the border is about 1,950 miles long, um, and the Secure Fence Act authorized 670 miles okay. of fencing on the border. Um, and that was finished by about 2009. So um, exactly what that fencing looks like varies in different places. In some places, it's a 20-foot high um, steel fence that's designed to stop a truck driving 60 miles an hour, mm -hmm. slamming into it. Um, in other places, um, it, it resembles more like a guardrail, essentially. Mm -hmm. So it's just designed to stop a truck from being able to just drive freely across the border in a remote section of desert. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of different stuff that's out there on the border. Um, but the the reality is that about two-thirds of the border is still completely unfenced um, okay. and doesn't have any federal fencing on it at all. And the, the cost for building these walls is, is really enormous. I mean, particularly if you want to do something more than just a guardrail, which probably you could put up fairly cheaply. Uh, but to build a significant uh, wall, such as has been recently proposed, you said the latest estimates that they saw were about how much per mile? Yeah, so it, it varies. I mean, right. the, the, the Trump administration over the last few months has had lots of different proposals for different lengths of walls here and there. Um, but the last time that I fact-checked it um, was uh, roughly $30 million per mile, and that was going to be to build about um, 500 new miles of fencing on the border. $30 million per mile. That's, that's amazing. I mean, you, you could do a lot of social good with $30 million, right? Yeah. So you could send a lot of kids to school, you could put a lot of youth through college, you could feed a lot of hungry kids. Yeah, a comparison that, that a number of people have made is that the National Endowment for the Arts in the United States has a budget of about $150 million right. per year, right. right? So six miles of border right. fence or wall would be equivalent of the entire budget of that, that organization. Yeah, yeah. So, so given that, and you know, then there's a whole other area we didn't really talk about, right? The environmental costs of building, particularly when you put, start putting solid walls, and you're really changing uh, the restrict the movement of animals, perhaps plants, perhaps water. All these things begin to get uh, costly in other ways too, but beyond the monetary costs. But so, let's let's think creatively here, and, and, and what, what, is, what are people considering as, as alternatives? I mean, there must be a, a wide slew of people who recognize this, that we can't, we can't spend that kind of money on an ongoing basis to build the wall and then maintain the wall and staff the wall and 
Uh, I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it is, but uh, I mean, I would say that right now in the, in the political sphere that there seems to be general support for that, mm -hmm. at least in, in one political party mm -hmm. in the United States. I mean, the, um, certainly Donald Trump staked his entire presidential campaign essentially on the slogan big, of build a wall, big, right? Beautiful wall, yeah. um, right? And, uh, and it seems like he's quite determined to make that happen mm -hmm. in, in some way or another. Um, you know, you talked about the, before we think about alternatives, um, you talked about the environmental impacts of building border walls. Um, something that a lot of people aren't aware of, um, so the 2006 Secure Fence Act allowed for the construction of the wall on the border um, that exists today. But there was a 2005 law that had a, one clause in it um, which gave the government uh, the ability to waive any laws in order to construct the fence. Um, and so since then, um, the, the Department of Homeland Security secretary is the one that has this authority, has waived 47 um, federal laws. So things like the Environmental Protection Act, the Antiquities Act, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, um, so what all that means is that we really don't know the environmental impacts of constructing these walls because the government hasn't had to do that. Mm -hmm. um, they've waived all of those requirements that would normally be in place before they carried out a big construction project. That are, that are typically very sensible and that are designed to protect the environment and ensure that we don't have bad erosion and wipe out species and uh, destroy habitat and, and reduce the viability of ecosystems, right? And so one can only presume if these are being waived right and left that those kinds of things are happening. Yeah, well, we, it's, we right. don't know, right? But um, the, I think it's safe to say that particularly for the, um, the ranges of a number of large species that live in the, the deserts of Arizona, for example, um, that traditionally have gone across the border, um, that when you put up a big fence, if the fence stops a human, it's also going to stop any other animals that are larger than the size of like a, you know, a, a rat or a bunny or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, the Border Patrol did, at least to their, their, their credit, when they were constructing it, um, there is a little gap at the bottom of a lot of the fencing that's mm -hmm. maybe about six inches high that's designed to allow small animals to mm -hmm. move back and forth across that. Mm -hmm. um, but larger animals like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, uh, you know, deer, mountain right. lions, those sort of things, um, obviously can't cross it either. Right, no, I mean, there's all kinds of evidence uh, from building just roads in, in habitat that animals cross, that the roads become huge barriers and the animals are reluctant to cross the roads. They yep. had to, in some cases, now go back and build, <coughs> raise the roads and build sort of passes under, under trying, sort of funnels, trying to get, allow animals passageway so they will actually move freely. So, and obviously you're not gonna do that if you have a border wall. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah. anything that would allow an animal to go through right. could allow a, a person to go right. through as well. And, on, but on top of this now, basically, I mean, the, the classic example that's given, right, is that all the 9-11 hijackers <coughs> had entered the U.S. legally with, uh, with visas, basically. They, they didn't sneak across the border, right? They came right in through our system perfectly openly. Yeah. So doesn't, uh, what, what is being considered in terms of these alternatives now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, the, the thing I would say with border walls is that they're often, the, the, the main purpose that they serve is they're symbolic, mm -hmm. right? They, the, and I think that the Trump campaign demonstrated that, right? Mm -hmm. That um, there were all these other issues that people were concerned about, whether it was the outsourcing of jobs, whether it's the idea that immigration is going to affect the culture in the mm -hmm. United States. Um, so a whole series of things, but it gets simplified down to the symbol of the wall, right? That by closing the border, it'll address all of these other sources sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. um, but the reality is the border doesn't really th have that much of an impact on many of those things. And with immigration, the, the evidence is quite clear. So in the U.S. right now, um, the, there are about 11 million undocumented people in the U.S., um, and more than half of those people um, came with valid documents um, across the border, whether to be a student or as a tourist, and it simply overstayed them, right? Mm -hmm. So building a wall on the border has no impact on any of those right. sorts of movements. Um, it's the same thing for drugs, right? Mm -hmm. you, you often hear people who are in favor of building the border wall um, use drug smuggling, mm -hmm. and cartels is the thing that they're um, that they talk about, right. um, but most of the drugs that enter the United States also come through the crossing points, mm -hmm. um, many of them in containers, mm -hmm. um, because uh, containers, um, I, I don't have the exact number, but it's something like only 5% of containers that enter the United States are searched. Mm -hmm. um, and so the drug smugglers know that they're going to lose some of their shipments right. to those that are searched, but the vast majority are going to come through. 
Um, so that's where most of the drugs mm -hmm. come through as well. The only drug that, that usually comes across the border itself um, is marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, other things like heroin um, uh, and, and a lot of the prescription drugs mm -hmm. as well, those are coming in containers. Mm -hmm. So that's, <coughs> again, you know, it just suggests that, that this is a, <coughs> excuse me, a feudal cycle here. Yeah, I mean, in, actually, if you think about it from the perspective of cartels, it's often an advantage for the cartels for it to be harder to cross the border, right? If anyone could make it across the border with drugs um, and, and sell them, then there wouldn't be that profit for the cartels, right? So more walls and more security actually benefits cartels because then often they're the only ones that can actually get stuff across the border. They're the ones that have those networks. They're the ones that have bribed the guards to get through. They're also the ones with the tunnels, right? right. At the, yeah, the U.S.-Mexico border, um, the Border Patrol since 1990 has found 227 tunnels under the U.S.-Mexico border. So if they found 227, <coughs> you'd have to imagine there's probably a good number more that they haven't found. Right. And then you have to question the the wisdom of maintaining any system that <clears throat> is supported by both organized crime and law enforcement. <laughs> yeah. If both those parties want the same thing, there's something a little odd going on, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Again, it gets back to your idea of a, the border industrial complex, right? Are these people sort of just mutually reinforcing the need for one another and, and helping drive each other's business? I don't know. No. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I've argued um, in, <clears throat> in some of my work that. Um, that a lot of the violence that surround the border is produced by actually having a border, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the um, the wealth inequalities mm -hmm. that we see across it is because of these different administrative systems. Um, the the existence of drug smuggling is because of these different rules about um, about using those those drugs, right? There, mm -hmm. People wouldn't smuggle those drugs if there was not a border across which to smuggle them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it's, it's very odd. Very odd to to, to think about that. The uh, the tensions that that creates, yeah. and, and you're right, the, the symbolism that they present to people, reminding them sort of just what they can or cannot do, you know, making some people feel safe and other people purposely feel excluded. Yeah, it's uh, it, it's it's a very interesting area. So before we before we wrap up here, I, I got I'm in a complete leap, completely different subject, okay. off off subject entirely. If you could have a superpower of either being Invisible or flying, which would you choose and why? <laughs> okay, that was unexpected. So, <laughs> um, I, I guess I would fly. I mean, that, uh, that seems like it would be pretty fantastic to be able to head up into the sky and see the world from the perspective of birds. Uh -huh. Okay, great. No, I was just, just uh, I heard to throw that in. I'm, just, I'm doing a little survey on this okay, show. Okay, okay. <laughs> but excellent. Well, so this, this has been a fascinating discussion here. We are running out of time very rapidly. So, uh, Reese, I, I want to thank you so much for coming here. You've, you've, you've taught me a lot today, and I know you've taught our, our audience out here, too. Um, so this is, this is all great. Thank you very much, and I wish you much luck in, in the pursuit of your research. Thank you. Thanks for having me on. Okay, and I hope you'll come back and uh, join Likeable Science next week. Until then, I'm Ethan Allen, your host, signing off. <laughs>